she's the most successful woman to ever hit video games. With 10 years, $15 billion, and 30 million games under her belt, Lara Croft has gone from idea to icon. Here's where it all started. In 1995, a young British animator named Toby Gard had an idea for a brand new type of adventure game. Featuring a male lead, the 3D third-person shooter was set in mysterious Egyptian pyramids and Aztec temples. The um, original idea for Tomb Raider was to make a game like uh, actually an interactive movie. It got me incredibly excited and that was really the, the, the core idea. A core idea he had while working at Core Design in the small UK town of Derby. He said, well, I fancy doing this game in pyramids. And I said, yeah, that's kind of cool. You know, he's got this guy on the screen with a whip and a hat. And, and I said, that's why he's bloody Indiana Jones. I mean, you know, you, you, you can't do this. So began the quest to design the character into something truly original. The leading man underwent, well, a sex change. Early iterations were based on a South American woman named Lara Cruz. Poor design wanted a UK-friendlier name. The name Croft came out of the phone book. The team sat down and the writer came down with the phone book and just went through the pages and called out things that, uh, that caught our eye and we go, oh, you know. Several names were put to a vote. Lara Croft took first place. God's gift to his new heroine, an unreal endowment. The goal was to um, have her as an exaggerated representation of the female form. That was the reason why she has such an exaggerated and caricatured figure, especially at that time when realism was impossible anyway. And suddenly there she was, Lara Croft on screen. Love at first sight. Hardly the case with one of Lara's hopeful platforms, the Sony PlayStation. Believe it or not, Sony USA initially rejected early versions of Tomb Raider asking for more materials and a better game. Long hours and late nights became the norm for the six-man creative team at Core Design, including an ambitious young engineer fresh out of school named Gavin Rummery. I created this tool called Room Edit because the whole game was set in tombs and it seemed a very good idea. We built rooms connected through a doorway into another room. I was thinking like two some car moons, tomb, things like that. That's the kind of thing we'd be doing. The results? a groundbreaking and innovative system of grids and complex levels. The intuitive control system allowed a vast set of athletic moves and mobility through water, which would blow popular 2D side-scrollers of the time out of the water. Sony was sold and eventually got on board alongside Sega Saturn. On Halloween day, 1996, Tomb Raider hit store shelves. The title's impact on the industry was instantaneous. Praised by critics for its gorgeous graphics, crisp full-motion video cutscenes and unprecedented gameplay, Core Design and parent company Eidos had a hit. The first day of sales was extraordinary. You know, she went straight to number one in a matter of minutes, effectively, and stayed there for a very, very long time. We as a company realized this was not just a video game. It had all the attributes, all the foundations, all the platforms to actually turn it into a true entertainment product. I've been told that if you took all of the copies of Tomb Raider that were sold and piled them one on top of the other, you'd have a building 27 times the height of the Eiffel Tower. What a monstrous, monstrous hit it is. But not everyone decided to share in the riches. In 1997, at the height of Tomb Raider's commercial success, Lara's creator decided to leave the company. Because a character like Lara Croft is, is essentially an asset for a company, there's always going to be opportunities for sorts of cross-promotional stuff. I certainly had a, a major problem with the way that Lara was being portrayed in, um, in the beginning of, of the franchise. I don't think that the, that the character would ever get into um, Maxim-style poses. Lara was his baby, and then people got on top of it, and they suddenly went, right, we're going to do it this, we're going to do that. And he really resented that, and he really didn't like that. That really upset him a lot. With seven million units of Tomb Raider sold, Eidos knew the show had to go on. Designers at Core instantly began work on a sequel. Toby was gone, but the question remained. Would Lara work without her creator?
By the end of 1996, Tomb Raider had become a household name overnight. The pressure was on. Without the help of Lara's creator, Toby Gard, Core Design had to deliver a new Lara and a series of action-packed sequels living up to the first game. In 1997, a new deal making Tomb Raider a PlayStation exclusive title provided a big boost for the franchise. It didn't hurt at all to have the first console to ever ship 100 million units on Lara's side. A success like Tomb Raider becomes sort of the holy grail of anybody setting out to write a game. Being exclusive to PlayStation allowed us to do a lot of advertising on behalf of the title. Tomb Raider helped PlayStation a lot, and in a way, PlayStation helped Tomb Raider a lot. In Europe, PlayStation is really the platform of choice. The character identified as PlayStation icon was good for both parties. On October 31st, 1997, Eidos launched the much-anticipated follow-up, Tomb Raider 2. This time, Lara had to hunt down an ancient Chinese artifact, which was also being chased by evil crime kingpin, Marco Bartoli. Core Design worked tirelessly to ensure that this chapter was filled with explosive action. Tomb Raider 2 was insane, my own personal point of view. I was working pretty much 24-7 for six months. Hard work paid off. Players got their hands on some cool new weapons and gadgets while cruising the world in a variety of innovative vehicles, like a snowmobile in Tibet or a speedboat through the canals of Venice. I always just loved it, actually, you could bomb around the canals in Venice, and I always thought that was really cool. And so did the rest of the world. Part two was an instant hit, selling seven million copies worldwide. By this point, Lara was an A-list celebrity, and Eidos knew that in order to meet demands, they would need to deliver even more hits. It sounded good in theory. We had no choice but to release another Tomb Raider year on year each Christmas. I mean, it controlled our lives for probably five or six years. I mean, it pretty much ruined most people's lives. Closest I've ever seen anybody to a mental breakdown. <laughs> Fans just wanted more Lara. That's what they got in 1998's Tomb Raider 3. Core design squeezed the PlayStation for all it was worth on this one. Top-notch graphics and innovative non-linear play accompanied Lara's trip out of the tombs and into London and the States. By 1999, Eidos knew it was time to evolve the franchise yet again. Tomb Raider 4, The Last Revelation, promised improved visuals and even graced a brand new console, the Sega Dreamcast. We'd get feedback from Tomb Raider 3 from a, a lot of people who felt we had gone too modern, so then Tomb Raider 4, we very much went back to the tomb. It was all set in Egypt. Personally, that's probably my favorite game. Certainly. It just felt like this is a complete game rather than a series of episodes. Developers had a nasty surprise for longtime fans. The game's cliffhanger ending showed Lara being buried alive in a tomb of her very own. People's feelings about Lara are actually quite mixed at core in a way because she was in a sense almost their taskmaster you know she was the one forcing them to get these games out year after year in a strange way that actually went as far as uh, trying to kill her off in Tomb Raider 4 just to try and avoid having to do Tomb Raider 5. I think the reason we uh, we attempted to kill Lara off was because we really thought we'd exhausted them what we could do with the franchise. Seeing Lara falling down a gigantic hole in the middle of the pyramid was quite a joyous moment. So I all you know went for a few pints and celebrated the death of Lara. But um, she came back and got us, you see. Lara promptly returned in 2000's Tomb Raider Chronicles, sort of. The game unfolded entirely in a series of flashbacks narrated by Lara's friends, who believed she was dead. She will live on forever in our hearts. As far as we were concerned, we'd kind of killed her off. So Tomb Raider 5, we did the best job we could, but whether our hearts were in it or not, I'm not entirely certain. By then, Lara was running out of breath. The franchise pushed the PlayStation 1 to its technical limits. Reviews and sales started to fall. Developers listened to fan feedback and began working on a brand new chapter in the story of Lara Croft titled Tomb Raider, The Angel of Darkness. Little did they know what trouble was waiting around the corner.
gamers were still buying Lara Croft's adventures by the Jeep codes in 2001. But critics and fans agreed, the series was losing its luster. With the release of the PlayStation 2, the Tomb Raider team decided to overhaul the game for next generation consoles quickly. The consensus was it needs to change. She needs to be able to talk to people, she needs to be harder edge, she's this, and this whole list of stuff which we all sat around and yeah, you know, we all bought into. But as that project went on, it was obvious we'd made it too big, and what we were trying to do was insane. I mean, just mad. The time limit wasn't really enough. The team size wasn't enough. We missed loads of deadlines. Angel Night is just four steps before it was really ready. In late 2003, the ambitious Tomb Raider, the Angel of Darkness, was released worldwide with some mixed results. Initial sales were strong thanks to an aggressive ad campaign, but critically, the game received lower scores for its glitchy graphics than awkward control schemes. I don't think you'd, you'd ever get anybody else to admit to Angel of Darkness that it was their fault. Ultimately, it was my fault, and I paid for that with my job, which I'm very happy about that. But it was done by committee, so you live or die by the sword. At the same time, players were migrating to newer action-adventure games. After the Angel of Darkness, Eidos made a tough decision. Stop. We're going to have to take this away. We've got to put this on. Jewel in the Crown franchise, we've got to be seen to be making a new start. So they took it over and gave it to the Crystal Dynamics of the States. In order to creatively jumpstart the series, Developers at Crystal Dynamics knew they would have to make some big changes for Eidos, while staying true to the series' roots. Coming back and starting to work on Tomb Raider Legend posed a number of challenges, because one of the biggest questions that were asked was, is the franchise still alive today? Is the consumer interested? An old friend jumped in to help answer those questions. Toby Gard, wiser from the experience of a decade earlier, Guard wanted to rekindle an old flame. I wanted to get back involved because I felt like I could help to sort of guide the brand and, uh, and guide Lara back in a sort of direction that I thought that the original Tomb Raider was taking it. With Toby's help, developers started the difficult task of reinventing the series. The overhaul began with the leading lady herself. For the newest game, the buxom booty hunter received a full body change. I uh, decided to sort of turn it on its head how we were looking, approaching the, the character design, which was to um, keep very, very caricatured proportions and shape, but then go for real realism in terms of muscle and bone structure and detail. Next up, Crystal Dynamics made Lara's actions much more fluid, allowing killer combinations of moves. Like a pro gymnast, Lara could run, jump and flip through Legend's intricate tombs. The new environments were a huge draw for longtime fans. In April of 2006, Eidos released Tomb Raider Legend. In the opening scene, nine year old Lara was traveling with her mother when the plane crash landed in the Himalayas. The Crofts stumbled on an ancient artifact, and Lara's mother accidentally got sucked into a bizarre time rift. The concept is this uh, plane crash that she suffered at a young age in the Himalayas and having to escape on her own, breaking her out of this sort of cosy lifestyle. Critics loved the revamped control scheme and called it a true return to the series' roots. The changes paid off. Legend sold over three million copies worldwide, becoming the fastest selling Tomb Raider game ever. Thanks to the daring facelift, the Tomb Raider series was back on track, and fans couldn't be happier. We've just really scratched the surface of what you can do with Tomb Raider up until now, and so the future, going, it's just going to hold so much more. If you thought a console could contain this virtual vixen, you're dead wrong. Lara Croft has a face that launched a thousand products or more, and Tomb Raider is a multi-billion dollar empire. Just think, 11 years ago, nobody ever heard of Lara. Then, in late 1996, her creator got a shock. 
I remember going down to the uh, game shop in the high street, standing in a queue and having people both ahead of me and behind me holding copies of the game and talking about how excited they were. And it was just this really strange feeling, realising that it actually was going to be majorly successful. Toby's hard-nosed heroine was a hit. Shortly afterwards, Lara landed on the cover of Britain's The Face magazine a spot typically reserved for real-life high-fashion trends. That was the defining moment that made a statement that we had something that was truly going to become mass market and successful. 249 magazine covers later, Lara was a worldwide phenomenon, signing lucrative international deals. You've got Tomb Raider scooters and Tomb Raider motorbike helmets. In France, Lara was made into a postage stamp. In Spain, she's been the face of SIA. They had a whole series of advertising based around Lara. <laughs> For more than a decade, advertisers have sought a piece of Lara to help boost sales. But how does IDOS do this without selling out? That's where Janet Swallow comes in. As VP of licensing, she's called daily by folks looking to stamp Lara on anything, from lunch pails to garden hoses, pizzas to bed sheets. Rarely does a product meet the cut. IDOS as a company is very, very protective over Lara. So we're very careful with the merchandise that we choose. We've had two odd requests. One of them is a racehorse owner called to say, could he call his racehorse after Lara? Which we declined. We were really worried that it would fall at the first hurdle. So we said that was no. And the second one was a tulip grower in Holland to name one of their branded tulips after Lara, which I thought was quite nice. While the official Lara tulip grows, other deals, such as Lara Croft knickers, wilt. I think maybe because that's quite a hard act to follow, you know, to put on some uh, underwear that's got Lara Croft on it with Lara's signature. I think it's a tough one. It was the weakest. Comic book publisher Top Cow approached Idos about serialising Lara's adventures in a monthly comic title. Idos loved the idea, and the series ran for five straight years. That same year, in pages of another kind, Lara Croft model Nell McAndrew posed for Playboy in the controversial spread, Lara Croft Nude. Idos pulled the trigger on the lawsuit, forcing Playboy to pull those copies from shelves and alter the cover. Perhaps the strongest deal in the history of the franchise went down in 2001. Lara Croft had all but conquered the game world. So, what's a young woman to do? Simple, head to Hollywood. But first, film producer Lloyd Levin had to convince studio execs to take a little gamble on Lara. There was very little awareness within the movie industry about the potential of video games. When we were submitting the property to the studios, there were a number of cases where we had to submit PlayStation consoles so they could play the game. Video games didn't have a great history of silver screen iterations. Box office busts like Super Mario Brothers turned off much of the game-based film viewing public. It was somehow assumed that it just wouldn't work. We never had any doubt, and we knew that it was a great opportunity to actually do something that was a little bit unprecedented. Paramount took a swing at the pitch and hit a grand slam. With heavy hitter Angelina Jolie filling Lara's boots, Tomb Raider 1 grossed almost $50 million opening weekend, 300 million total. The film eclipsed Alien as the highest moneymaker with a female lead. A second Tomb Raider followed in 2003, and buzz about a third movie can now be heard worldwide. Looking ahead, there's sure to be plenty more Lara coming your way. From an animated series to a theme park, the whole world is still Croft crazy. The fact that she's 10 years old in game is quite a long time. So I think she's a digital icon for computer games, not just for now, but forevermore. Rather like James Bond has survived 40 years in the movie industry, Lara Croft is the digital icon of the computer games world. As a franchise, Tomb Raider has done just about anything a video game can do. But there's always room for another first. Through the years, Eidos has chosen one young lady to be Lara. For the first time ever, all past live-action Laras come together for a high-profile photo shoot. For 
Ian Livingston, creative director at IDOS. It's a family reunion of sorts. I've been so pleased to be the real Lara's father, to see all my daughters back here in one room again, all giggling and reminiscing about their days with Lara. It's fantastic, and they're all enjoying it, I'm pleased to say. I think I'm the only one who's really aged. They look amazing. Here's a year-by-year -year look at a decade of devastatingly dashing dames. It has changed my life. Even now, actually, I still get lots of letters from people all over the world, which is just mind-blowing. I can't believe people still associate you with the character and just really still are big fans of the game itself. Having a child is amazing. What can I say? It's the best thing that I've ever done, and I think it really makes me feel realise what life's about. It kind of puts everything in perspective. The first time when I heard about Lara Croft was when my friends were playing this game day and night and I was like, what are you playing? What, what are you obsessed about? They said, oh, this is Lara Croft, you know, she's really hot and actually you do look a bit like her and you've got the same name. It was meant to be. When I went to character, I felt very strong, very confident, very sexy, very powerful because, you know, Lara Croft is all that. I was the youngest ever, so I was just turned 17. When you get into the outfit, you're a changed person. You're just in the role of Lara Croft, and you can do anything, and everyone looks at you like you just stepped out of the video game. I think it's a feeling that I'll never have again. My best memory of being Lara Croft was my biggest fan, who was from Amsterdam, and I think he bought my wisdom teeth on the internet. I think that made his day, really made his year. I think when I became Lara, I didn't know who I was as a person. And traveling with a group of people around the world, especially being 17 and new, it kind of made me who I am today. So it meant a lot to me, and I'll always remember it. I definitely felt like character transformation because it was really stepping into Laura's skin. I was really out there and ready to kick some ass. I was extremely tall with my boots and it was just really intimidating. People would really be, you know, like astonished. And I love to make people smile, I love to entertain, so it was, uh, it was great fun. It's just really nice that you can see that some fantasies do become reality. Do they ever? The photo shoot was a resounding success. One, three, one, two, three. I think one more, that was pretty hard. Much like the game, the Lara model has evolved too. In 2006, the latest Lara, Karima Adibib, tackled unprecedented training with the British military. From army combat to zipline tactics, Karima's role as Lara was the toughest yet. Can she live up to the top-notch standards set by IDOS? Time will tell. When I first got the job, I was told there were previous Laras before me, and I remember getting home and getting on the internet immediately, trying to do my research on these girls. I've taken a lot from what they've already done, because they're my predecessors. To better myself, I, I take the best qualities and try and put it into one. Leipzig, Germany. Nearly 200,000 people prepare to descend on the largest video game conference in the world. They want two things, a look at the latest games and a glimpse of Karima Adabib. <laughs> Her journey here began when she was just 10 years old. Everyone in school was talking about this new game that was coming out, Lara Croft. So I kept begging my mum, please, I want it for Christmas, I want it for Christmas. So I got it and I was just obsessed with it. So began Karima's training to assume the role of her own childhood heroine. Growing up in Morocco, I spent a lot of my time exploring, hiking, playing a lot of sports, living in the sun. At 18, athletic by nature and a gamer at heart, Karima had a go at modeling. I got this call saying there's a casting for Lara Croft. I'm Lara. Lara Croft. 
Lady Lara Croft. Lara Croft. Lara Croft. I am the girl for this mission. With more than a thousand models gunning for a rather unique role, the competition was tough. But Idos knew right away who their Lara would be. She's obviously a very striking young lady. She's very intelligent. She speaks six languages. Karima is just extremely gifted at working a crowd. She gives every single person a little piece of her. Karima is about to wade into a sea of 183,000 convention visitors, 2,600 journalists, and 368 exhibitors from 25 countries. To be honest, I don't know whether it's the weight of the boots or whether it's the heaviness of the holsters. This sort of strange thing happens to me. The arms go up, the elbows go out, the back stands straight. I turn into Lara. A brand ambassador for a franchise that has sold more than 30 million units worldwide, Karima's day is an adventure itself. The first time someone held a mic in my face, it was awful. I couldn't stop shaking, stuttering, stumbling. But now, it's just like second nature. I find that now the people that are putting the mics in my face are shaking. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Laura is intimidating. I do get asked a lot of the same questions. One of them being, how do I feel about Angelina Jolie? Played on the film, I hope. No, no, no. I was in Alien vs. Predator. Yes, I was a sacrificial maiden. I got killed by a face hugger. <laughs> What else? How did I get the job? What I was doing before the job? What are my intentions later on? Do I want to be an actress? Do I want to be a writer, an astronaut? Do I have a boyfriend? Am I going to get rid of him? What happens on level seven? And Karima knows exactly what happens on level seven. A fact that does not escape fans' chat rooms, blogs, and message boards. Do a hit, man. All the boys love her. But the great thing is she's got lots of female fans for the fact that she's intelligent and she's strong and she's just as witty and clever. Lara is beautiful both in and out. Can't get any better than that. And with tens of thousands of fans clamoring for attention, an autograph, a hug, or bullets... You need to train. This mission is one that Karima is proud to tackle. I put a lot of heart into this job for the fact that I am a gamer. I've grown up with Lara, and now, 10 years later, for the 10th anniversary, I am Lara. It's an odd job, it's an exciting job. It's a job that takes you all around the world. Who knew you could be Lara Croft as your day job? When Toby Gard first created Lara Croft, he had no idea a controversy was also conceived. For the past decade, Lara has been dubbed both feminist icon and pixelated play toy. In terms of how females have been portrayed in games up until Tomb Raider 1, they had been often portrayed purely as objects, and normally damsels in distress or just terrible fantasy sort of dominatrix style characters. But Lara was born during the late 90s, the height of what the Spice Girls called girl power. Even still, at the time, convincing execs to let a woman star in her own game proved difficult. Traditionally, all games had male characters because they were played by boys. But these boys hadn't stopped playing games. They just got older. And what would they rather look at? Hedgehog, Plumber, or Lara Croft's firm bum? With the benefit of hindsight, no pun intended, it was an obvious answer. Male gamers swooned for Lady Lara, a sex symbol for the digital age. Are men only interested in you because of your body? No, I'm rich too, darling. Women have also fallen in love with her kick-ass, no-nonsense attitude. A former editor at Ms. Magazine, Jennifer Baumgardner, is a prominent woman's advocate who writes for Harper's and NPR. Lara Croft is she's just simply in the tradition of a long line of women who can protect themselves and who are warriors from Xena the Warrior Princess to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's good to have protagonists that are women. So not just the people who are being saved are women, but the people that can do the saving are women. But not every woman dug Lara. When Two Made a Two dropped, Idos advertised the new game with a series of commercials that played up Lara's sexiness. 
as fans rushed to stores to buy Tomb Raider 2, the controversy heated up. Ismini Roby is the chief editor and co-founder of WomenGamers.com, the largest women's game portal on the internet. They put her in bikini photo shoots and anything that they could to make her even more appealing to that fanboy audience. To watch Laura Croft be marketed more as a sexual object, I was extremely disappointed. So was Lara's creator. In fact, Toby Gard left the franchise over the new portrayal. Still, when well-known feminists like Jermaine Greer argued that the heroine was nothing more than an adolescent fantasy, Gard took objection. I think that her comment of um, Lara Croft being a sergeant major with balloons stuffed up his shirt is a little bit like saying any sensitive guy who has any non-macho tendencies is just a woman with like, banana stuff down her trousers, and I think that it's nonsense. Thanks to Tomb Raider Legend's more realistic model of Lara in 2006, the uproar died down a bit. But that hasn't stopped the headbutting over the legacy of the video vixen. In our society, there's a big focus to be thinner. There's a certain kind of woman that everybody kind of wants to be, the tall, the thin, with the big breasts. It would be interesting to see companies making more realistic varieties of women. I don't think that having those sorts of fantastic, idealized images out there in the world are what girls who have issues with self-esteem, I don't think they're comparing themselves to a video game. If Laura Croft was a real person, she would not be able to walk. Her back would not be able to support her boobs. And to see Laura Croft scaling a mountainside with makeup and really short shorts, completely unrealistic. Well, as a feminist, I guess I come down pretty hard on the side that if Lara Croft wears revealing clothes, hey, she's got it. She should flaunt it. Love her or hate her, there's no doubt that Lara is here to stay. When it comes to fans, there are few more passionate than Lara lovers. Since the birth of the franchise, fanatics have found some pretty creative ways to honor their favorite Tomb Raider. Katie Fleming, a 20-year-old student from Canada, has created one of the web's most popular Tomb Raider fan sites and authored 10 original novellas based on Lara. Lara arched her body midway to decrease her overall distance and landed half a foot from where she eyeballed. Not bad. Half a million folks have logged on to Katie's site to have a read, and in March of 2003, her tales took first prize at a worldwide fan fiction contest sponsored by Core Design. I wrote my first story just for fun for myself, and I continue to write for myself. If I'm happy with it, then that's what I'm going for, but to have other people read them and really like them is like an extra bonus for me. Katie has also produced, directed, and starred in her own low-budget tribute film. Almost at the spot. Just have to duck outside and find the entrance. It was minus 18 degrees Celsius, which is about zero degrees Fahrenheit outside, in shorts and a tank top. And it was freezing, but it was a lot of fun. Lara has changed my life in so many ways. Chantelle Slagmolen from Amsterdam claims that she is Lara's number one fan. There was a lookalike contest and I decided to enter. I uh, did not win, unfortunately, but from then on, I really got interested in it and it was loads of fun to do. Her stunningly accurate portrayal made Chantelle a celebrity among Lara fans. She's been invited to conventions around the globe and was chosen as a stand-in for design work on Tomb Raider Chronicles. Chantelle drew from her work with Eidos and started doing drawings of her own. I mainly do just single drawings of Lara. It starts off with a small sketch and then it gets transferred to the computer and depending on that, I digitally color it or just digitally ink it. She eventually fell in love with the art form and made a life-changing decision. I was studying computer science and while being around Lara and in the environment Lara was created in, she sort of inspired me to go to art school, which I've finished now with a degree, and doing graphic designer jobs, which I really love. We're the world's biggest Tomb Raider fans because... Because nobody else ever got one of these from her. In 2001, Lara tackled the role of matchmaker for a pair of fansite forum surfers. 
code names Goran Agar and Katsuk and Ponytail. He lived in Germany. She lived in Canada. No distance was too great for these Lara lovers. Kat flew to Goran. And it was love at first sight. Lara Croft brought us together, and she's been all around us since then. When we entered the office of the Registrar of Marriages, what was hanging behind his desk was a tumular poster. I mean, what better signs do you want? <laughs> Their honeymoon was even a retracing of Lara's steps in Tomb Raider 3. Today, the domestic duo spends time caring for their brood. A collection of life-size Lara statues considered one of the largest in the world. This house we built, we built with our Lara Croft figures in mind. We wanted to have places to display them to their full potential. And I think we've managed to pull it off pretty well. Quite well. <laughs> the healthy obsession doesn't stop there. Goran and Kat both started their own Tomb Raider websites, and Goran actually reworked a level of Tomb Raider legend with someone close to his heart in the lead role. Just in case you're wondering, that's their wedding portrait above the mantle. None of what you see around us would have happened if we never met Lara Croft. If we never played Tomb Raider, we would never have gone to Eidos' forum, and we would never have met each other, and we would never have married. And that would have been a damn shame. So Lara Croft basically made us happy. Yes. She gave us the biggest gift we've ever gotten. In early 2006, a mysterious trailer for a video game called Tomb Raider Anniversary Edition leaked onto the web. Within minutes, fans around the globe were buzzing over what appeared to be the next Tomb Raider coinciding with Lara Croft's 10th birthday. The video was not a true representation of an upcoming game, but Eidos did confirm they were creating a new action-packed game based on the original Tomb Raider. There was a kind of a series of emotions that we went through when we found out that uh, we were gonna get to make the next Tomb Raider game. You kind of realize, holy crap, we have to make the next Tomb Raider. There's a great sense of responsibility on our shoulders and, and reverence to the original game that we don't want to mess up in any way. But just why did they come up with a plan to enhance Lara's first adventure? Who better to answer that question than the man who started it all? This gives us an opportunity to actually tell the story that we were trying to tell in the first place, and also to put a bit more emotional resonance into it. I wanted to bring more of an emotional sort of side to the story, so it kind of evolved into more of a question, Lara discovering how far she's willing to go to pursue her sort of goals, how far she'll step beyond sort of what's morally acceptable to achieve her goals. And that, I think that's very interesting. Developers at Crystal Dynamics knew that updating the classic was a challenge even a new and improved Lara might be afraid to tackle. The most difficult part is taking those memorable pieces of Tomb Raider 1 and recreating them in a way that's fresh, but at the same time totally evokes nostalgia. To better understand why the original game deserved an encore, developers went back and played it again, and again, and again. We went back, played through it, really to make sure that we're hitting all the things that people remember from the original game. I think I'm over 100 planes of Tomb Raider 1, which makes me an uber geek. While developers practically memorized part one, the series creator worked tirelessly to expand the story of Lara's journey, recovering a mythical artifact called the Skion and solving the mystery of Atlantis. A fleshed out storyline isn't the only surprise. Slick new moves round it all out. She's now got a grapple. She has more moves than she had in the original game. We're improving where we can while still trying to stay within the boundaries of what the original game was really about. You're going to get your nostalgia, you're going to get those locations you remember, those encounters you remember, but they're just going to be executed at a much higher production level. Along with higher production value, gamers can expect to hear a newly orchestrated version of the original classic score. Making music to our ears is the job of Trolls Folman, composer for Tomb Raider Anniversary. 
with Anniversary Edition is really about being faithful to the old games. I think everybody will recognize that the old themes are there, they'll absolutely know all the tunes, the main theme is scored exactly the same way, but just with a little more advanced types of orchestration on it. Enhancements don't stop there. Players will get some pretty interesting eye candy this time around. My favorite part of the game would have to be the T-Rex fight. I mean, everybody sort of remembers that from the first one, so we brought it back and we're trying to make it as great as we can to really hit everybody's expectations of what their memory of the original game is. The bit I'm most excited about seeing is the cat mummies. They're definitely not cute. Thanks to the improvements, Tomb Raider Anniversary is bound to uncover a whole new legion of fans. Gamers from the crypts of Cairo to the tombs of Tunisia are keyed up for Lara's big birthday bash. If we have one message for the fans out there, it's that we're doing our best to make a faithful recreation of the original Tomb Raider experience and that we're really doing it for you guys and we hope you enjoy it.